Welcome to the Low Carb MD Podcast. No one is beyond help. No one is beyond hope. As we have always said, we are bringing you medical information and cutting edge science, but none of this is medical advice. Please seek out input from your own doctor. Hello and welcome back to the Low Carb MD Podcast. Tro, today we did it again. We found someone smarter than us. First of all, how are you doing, Tro? I'm, I'm doing good. I, uh, we got a lot going on. We have a community event that we're doing. Uh, we're get, trying to get our community walking, Brian. And even You're behind the, the times, man. Yeah, we're trying to get our community walking. and certain. So we're walking on Sunday. Okay, if you're in the New York, New Jersey area, come walk with us on Sunday. Uh, text the office. We'll let you guys know about it. And even, even with that, you know, like when we were first organizing this walk, this community walk, you know, the, the, the uh, town was like, are you sure you're allowed to do that? You know, it's a bunch of doctors coming together trying to do an outdoor walk. And, the, you know, the towns are, are asking us, are you sure you want to do that during a time like this? Oh, you know, yeah, yeah, uh, that's it. They haven't looked at the football stadiums, have they? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I don't I don't know. We're going to plead the fifth. Listen, this yeah, is yeah. going to be a good one, Brian. So I just wanted to give you, but anyway, I do to do a little plug. If you're around the New York, New Jersey, Connecticut area on Sunday and you want to join us for a walk Sunday, the 26th, if you want to join us for a walk, just text the office, message me on social media, we'll get you there. Uh, it's going to be a fun time. Or you could come to San Diego and we walk year round because we, we don't have <laughs> snow and sleet and ice and floods and all that kind of stuff. Just earthquakes, but they don't interfere. So, Tro, we have a great guest today. Oh, it's going to be fun. I can't wait. I can't wait. We have Michelle Hearn. She's a real dietitian. Like she wrote a book called The Dietitian's Dilemma, just like what we ran into. Great book. And she's doing great stuff. And she's just a great spirit. She just spoke at Low Carb USA San Diego. I was like, she's awesome. So, and everyone loves her. Everyone I talked to, goes, have you met her? Have you met her? Have you? No, I haven't. No one talks to me. <laughs> everyone social distances from me, Tro. Michelle, yeah. welcome. Good to have you. Good to <laughs> Thank have you. She's so like, much man. For that. <laughs> Thank people you so are much like, for that introduction. I appreciate it. I'm really excited to be here. Yeah, it's so great to have you. And she's a stud, Tro. She runs, she does all kinds of Tell us your story. Tell us how, okay. like, how you got to do what you're doing in life and all that kind of stuff so people know who you are. Yeah, yeah. So I'll try to I'll try to give you the Reader's Digest version, but let me back up. I mean, my my initial health story starts when I was 12 years old. So um, born and raised in uh, Plano, Texas, right outside the Dallas area. I'm the youngest of four. I have three older sisters. And when I was 12, I was diagnosed with a really serious eating disorder. I was diagnosed with anorexia. At that time, it was called anorexia nervosa. I was about five feet tall and 57 and a half pounds. So really, really sick. Um, I was immediately put in an inpatient hospital, um, put on a 24 hour two feeding system. I actually, at that time, the doctor told my parents I had about a 10% chance to survive and even less chance to like fully thrive. Like, Hey, you know, you know, might not grow, you might not develop. So as you can imagine, that was a pretty scary thing to, to hear as a 12 year old. Um, and that was actually my first interaction with the dietitian. you know, I worked with the, or met the dietitian at the the recovery center. And even then, you know, as a 12 year old, I remember the things she was telling me, I was like, you know, this doesn't really make sense. And, um, at that time, you know, I was put on seven different medications. I had severe anxiety. I was that the tube feeding I was getting, you know, the main ingredients of, of tube feeding formulas back then, uh, maltodextrin, soy protein, corn syrup. I was having severe GI issues. Uh, and you know, in my book and in my advocacy, I'm really, really hard on healthcare. You know, but I do um, think when you have an acute problem, you know, our healthcare system is second to none. You know, that did save my life. And I was, I became weight restored. You know, I, I was able to gain weight, but I was told, I was told as a young person, you know, you're going to have eating disordered thoughts. You're going to deal with constant racing anxiety, probably the rest of your life. So I just had to, you know, I kind of came to the conclusion like, okay, this is, this is what I'm going to have to deal with. You know, I suffered with severe anxiety. I was, constantly um, worried about food, questioning what should I eat. I was living on that blood sugar roller coaster, you know, I ate the standard American diet. And I decided to uh, become a dietitian. I was like, well, maybe I can learn more about food. Maybe I can help people with food because I knew at my heart food was powerful. You know, it had saved, saved me from dying. Um, and kind of fast forward, I, I entered the dietetic internship in 2008 
And from the get go, I was kind of pegged as this like difficult dietetic student because I would just ask questions. We would go see, see people in the hospital. And this is 2008 with severe type two diabetes, you know, uh, A1C of 13 or 14 massive infections. And I would just ask my dietetic preceptor, I'd say, Hey, um, why don't we feed these people less carbohydrates? You know, why, why are we giving them 75 grams of carbs a meal or 15 grams of snack and giving them insulin? And I was just, Oh, Michelle, everybody needs carbohydrates. They're important for energy. Your brain needs them. And then I'll never forget the first time I was in the, um, the ICU as a student and I flipped over the tube feeding and I was like, Oh my God, this is the same stuff I was fed when I was 12 years old. This is almost 25 years later, tube feeding formulas, standard tube feeding formulas are still maltodextrin, corn syrup, solids, soy protein. So I would just pose questions. I would say, is this the best way to feed somebody who's maybe been in a traumatic car accident or has a small bowel obstruction? And, you know, once again, I was just told like, Hey, you need to, you need to get in line. You need to chill out. Like, um, and of course, you know, the Academy of Nutrition, who is the governing board of all dietitians is heavily sponsored by processed foods. At that time they were sponsored by Coca-Cola and Pepsi, Frito-Lay. <laughs> now I shared at the low carb USA, we have some exciting new sponsors, including Barilla Pasta, uh, the national confectionery association. Yes. We are literally sponsored by candy. And so, yeah, so I just, it was challenging. It was really challenging because, you know, you're young. So you're like, okay, this is what I'm going to do. And um, yeah, I started practicing and as a acute care dietitian and just my patients weren't getting better. So it was, it was really challenging, but you know, it wasn't really until I lost my own health that I made a dramatic switch to the low carb world. And that's kind of when <laughs> my life changed and I wrote the book. Wow. You're going to get some trouble. Michelle, because that's the Tro and I are 100% with you. We've talked about this at length, all this stuff. And the big sin that you committed was critical thinking because you're thinking, wait, this doesn't make sense. And Tro and I got into that with our, I'm like, does this make sense that we're giving sugar to people that their sugar is 300 and then shooting them with insulin to get rid of the sugar we're giving them. And like people look at you like you're crazy. And, and as a dietitian, it's so dangerous because the governing bodies and in medicine, we're learning this a lot more right now is that if you say the wrong thing, even though you may be correct, you can lose your license or you can get in big trouble. And that's one of the things that you, your dilemma is, look, I'm not helping people doing the standard of care. Now I got to need to change. I have to make a change of what I'm doing. And that's not popular. Yeah. And that's why, I mean, and that was kind of the, the title behind the dietitian's dilemma, like that literally, what do you do when your health is restored by doing the opposite of what you were taught? You know, I first really raised some red flags. I was practicing in Colorado in a hospital um, in Boulder, Colorado. And I'm sure you, you and Dr. Tro ex experienced this. You have a huge patient load. You have all these patients. You have such little time to see people. And I felt like, once again, the nutrition guidelines, they weren't helping people. You know, I'm having people with severe diabetic infections. They needed a reduction in sugar. They needed a reduction in carbohydrates. And, you know, they're, I'm looking at their meal trays and they have, you know, cereal and they have this insure. And so I sat down with my supervisor. I said, look, one, I, I need more time with people. And two, we, we've, got, we've got to remove some of these carbohydrates. This isn't working. And she basically told me like, look, all you need to do, see the patient, chart what you see and move on. And to me, that was just like, so I'm literally just getting paid to check boxes. Like it's not my job to actually help anybody. And it, it starts to break you. I've had several dietitians reach out to me and just say like, I don't know if I can do this. And then there's also that pervasive, uh, I've had doctors tell me like, look, it's not the guidelines that are the problem. It's that patients aren't compliant, but we know, I mean, I did some research. I cite this in my book since the 1970s, guess what? We're eating more fruits and vegetables. We're eating more quote unquote healthy whole grains and we're eating significantly less animal fat and, <laughs> and our rates of diabetes and chronic diseases, you know, and it's just, it, it's hard because, and it's not just diabetes, like diabetes is obviously an epidemic, but I also, I worked in two different psychiatric facilities. You know, a lot of people don't know that depression is the number one cause of disability in this country. You know, I saw people with severe depression, anxiety, bipolar disorder, uh, people with kidney failure, people with heart disease. <laughs> and I literally like watching the food that we're feeding patients. I'm sure you, you know this in the hospital, a patient that had uh, heart disease, they got 144 grams of carbohydrates, but they weren't allowed to have beef or salt. 
It's like, what are we doing? You know? Um, yeah. It just, it's, it's backwards. Yeah. I think one of the, one of the most uh, important things is, you know, it sounds like you went through the system kind of early on. I mean, you're 12 years old um, and you were given kind of the standard approach and you went through that. Right. Um, and I think it sounds like that led you to have like a pretty critical way of looking at the industry. Right. You know, pretty critical way of looking at things. I've shared on the podcast that when I was 13, I had a, you know, uh, I was never, you know, because men are really, they, they don't get anorexia, right? This is 30, 40 years ago, whatever it is. They don't get anorexia. <laughs> we know that that's false. Of course, um, yeah. Right. And uh, so I was never put inpatient. I'm sure if I was a 13 year old girl, I would have been put inpatient for what I did, which is basically stopped eating for a month, you know? Um, and you know, you want to know what though? It's like funny. I look back on my life and I'm like, that was my first exposure to ketosis, mm. right? That was my first exposure to ketosis, right? Like we're surrounded by constant food, uh, chronic, you know, basically crap food everywhere. Right. And it was terrible because my first introduction to this just wonderful way of eating was the shame and the guilt, the weight stigma, you know, it was all these negative things that led to these drastic measures. But that also gave me a, I want to think that it's at some point it made me think, think differently, you know, um, like I want to say subconsciously made me think differently. So I'm trying to think, okay, you're a young kid going through these struggles you know, your parents are obviously concerned about you. You go inpatient. I mean, what kind of, did that inspire you? Like, where did that leave you? You know, uh, I mean, you went off to dietetics. We know that dietitians suffer from anorexia at a rate of about 10 times the average population, right? So right. Tell, help me understand, like, what what's forming you? How do you end up in dietetics? I mean, I can imagine being a kid suffering from it. I can't, I can imagine it because I went through it and wanting to do nothing, a part of that system that made them <laughs> eat. So um, walk me through some of this, like what, what's your origin? What's the origin, you know? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, I, sh you know, share in the book that I remember when I, you know, when I was 12 and, you know, I was, you know, dropped off at uh, Wickenburg, Arizona. I mean, you know, my parents are from Texas. I literally drop you off, leave you. And I heard, you know, I actually was told like, hey, you need to sit here. We need to talk to your parents in a different room. And of course I'm 12, so I don't listen. I kind of like snuck and tried to hear what they were saying. And when the doctor told my, my parents that, you know, I had a, like I said, about a 10% chance to live, I remember feeling incredible relief. Um, and that's a really hard thing to admit. Like at that point, like I didn't, I didn't want to live like as someone who was suffering with an eating disorder, like every moment of my life was filled with thoughts around food around anxiety. I was so underweight that I was, I was bruising. Um, I was being physically, uh, abused in school. I was being bullied. I was being, so it was, um, it was a really low, dark moment. And, um, <laughs> I even remember being disappointed, you know, as I went through treatment that I was still alive, you know, which is just as an adult looking back, I'm like, Oh my gosh, it's just hard to think that someone so young was going through that. Um, yeah. And then as I got a little older, you know, I, I really wanted to participate in sports. Like I wanted to, um, I, I used to before, <laughs> before I was sick with anorexia, you know, obviously played in the backyard, I played soccer. And I ended up, you know, I was, I was short, I was uncoordinated. And so I got cut from the basketball team and I started, uh, was on the cross country team and I just fell in love with running. And so part of my drive to, to be healthy and to eat was, you know, you have to, you have to eat to run. And I finally had a team. I had this camaraderie and I was just so curious. I was curious, like how can nutrition affect my performance? How can nutrition, um, you know, impact just everything about my life. So yeah. And I, my, like I said, I'm the youngest of um, 
four and my two oldest sisters are MDs. So I knew, <laughs> I knew even as a younger person, I wasn't necessarily interested in going to medical school, but I was just curious, curious about the human body, curious about food. Um, and of course at that time I was, you know, thinking that I was going to be teaching people about carbohydrates and about glucose, like for the rest of my life. But, um, yeah, just, you know, obviously as time went on and as, uh, as I became a dietitian and became disheartened, you know, it wasn't, like I said, it wasn't really until 2019 that I, that I made a really big uh, nutritional switch. So, you know what, Michelle, it's like, I keep seeing these parallels. I like did the same exact thing, anxious, anorexia, and then found running and joined the cross country team. It's like, I met my doppelganger. Okay. <laughs> uh, now, do you think that the um, exercise played a role in your mental health at the time? You know, do you think that like that, you know, uh, or do you think it was kind of you were already healing? Uh, because I'm a firm believer that exercise is a mental health tool, you know, oh, so I'm I just mean, curious. Absolutely. I mean, I think, you know, unfortunately at that time, I mean, even when I was younger, um, you know, I still had some pretty severe anxiety, but for me, it was, it was definitely something to look forward to. Even as, as I become an adult, it was a, it's a stress relief. It's, um, you know, it's a, it's something you believe in. It was something I could set a goal, you know, I'm going to run this many miles. And it was the, it was the camaraderie too, that I was just, I was around people, people that cared, people that wanted to be healthy. Um, so yeah, to answer your question, absolutely. So, um, okay. So you have a family in the healthcare field, you're kind of going through these things, you find exercise, you're like, you know what, if I want to exercise like this, I need to fuel my body. And then, um, you land into dietetics and what like now I can just imagine somebody who's been through what you've been through <laughs> wanting to basically question every single thing that you're <laughs> being told. So what's it like in dietetics school and thinking a little bit differently, having the experiences you experience? Actually, you know what? It's not quite unique because if you look, there's probably at least one in 10 dietitians have an eating disorder or have those tendencies, right? Uh, healthcare professionals have an incredible rate of eating disorder. So did you see, um, what was it like? What was it like being schooled and educated? You know, kind um, of in that. Yeah, you know, it's, there really isn't a lot of room for individual thought, for sure. You know, they, they encourage you. It's kind of like the group thing. Like, <coughs> excuse me, I got like a, frog in my throat. Let me grab a glass of water. Do you need a COVID swab? <laughs> no, I definitely don't need a COVID swab. Brian, I'm getting us in trouble again. Yeah, I know, man. Troll. What are we going to do? You too. Okay. Long right. is running. Something wrong with you too, but that's <laughs> yeah, all good. Yeah, you know, throughout, I, I, I definitely noticed in diet, you know, in dietetics that you're not encouraged to think independently. Like anytime you ask something kind of outside of the box, it's like, well, let's come back to, um, you know, just you you learn there, they're just things that I know now that was not taught. Did they, did they teach you that, you know, diet could improve anxiety symptoms, that diet can improve chronic pain, that oh, diet yeah. can improve knee arthritis. Did they <laughs> show you, did they show that depression scores improve with diet or did they basically teach you about energetics and thermodynamics? Can you help me yes. understand? Like, do they go through, do they say that, you know, like, did you walk out of dietetics thinking like, wow, these people are interested in the study of nutrition? Or did you think like, these people are just teaching me to tell people to eat better? Yes. I mean, this, the second thing of what you said, I had no idea that diet could improve mental health. Like you're kind of given a very basic, like, oh, you eat more fruits and vegetables. You might feel better. You eat less sugar. You might feel better. But I was taught that, you know, diet you, will help you manage your diabetes. It can help you potentially manage chronic diseases, but never did we talk about reversing chronic diseases. We didn't talk about reversing chronic pain. Um, and you know, now that I've been in this field, the things that I've seen that have changed with diet, like you said, everything from obesity to acne, to, um, irritable bowel syndrome to, um, you know, I, I had so many patients throughout my career that are just so overly fat and under muscled, you know, sarcopenia, we can reverse sarcopenia, heart disease. We can actually improve measures of heart disease. 
Um, I was taught as somebody who struggled with an eating disorder, you could never, never, never um, encourage someone struggling with any type of eating disorder to follow a low carbohydrate or ketogenic. I was actually taught that ketogenic diets were dangerous, high fat diets were dangerous, um, could, could lead to heart disease. I mean, it was kind of like a bad word <laughs> in the dietetics field. Um, and then, of course, people confuse ketosis with ketoacidosis, which is just silly. Uh, yeah, no, it, I, I left dietetics thinking that I could help people potentially manage chronic disease by making small dietary improvements. I had no idea that I could actually help people completely change their lives. Yeah, I think it's it's such a hard thing. Yeah, as a matter of fact, I was, I'll tell you, Michelle, because this will be of interest to you, but I was just learning this stuff and I put on a continuous glucose monitor. I was monitoring and I was really intrigued by my numbers, what I was seeing when I was fasting, what I was seeing when I was working out hard, what I was seeing in different um, uh, conditions. And so I have two um, dietitians from two different hospitals I took care of at the time and at the time, but, you know, I've changed practices since then, but, you know, it was mind blown because I said, we're a CGM for a week. We're just we're for a week or two. This is your career path. So you can see, because I said, look, look at this. And it was me. And I said, look at this, this sugar reading. And they go, aha, look at that spike at five o'clock last night. They ate. And I said, that was a workout. That was a kickboxing workout. Right. And it spiked my sugars. So how much should I have carb loaded for that? And how much should I have carb loaded for this? And why did my sugars not go low when I wasn't eating? So where's the sugar coming from? How's it sustaining? And they, they had no idea. And they're like, and both of them independently said, now what do I do? Because they saw that what they were doing, I said, go put a CGM and do what you're doing. You're telling patients to do, and then do what I'm telling you to do and see what happens. Just look at the numbers. And I think that's why there's a big pushback because when you see the numbers, it changes and people say, oh, oh, that's not good. I don't think I should be having this cereal with toast for breakfast with a glass of orange juice when they see their sugar go to 400. Yeah. And unfortunately, what we see a lot in dietetics is a lot of people who enter the field. Like I was um, one of 23 interns. Um, you know, we're 24, we're 25, we're young, mostly female, and most people are metabolically healthy. And so it's like, well, I'm metabolically healthy and I can eat a bunch of carbs. Why can't my patients, you know, do this? And so it becomes this huge disconnect, you know, and I, um, after uh, through my adolescence, you know, I, I became a runner. I became a long distance runner. I, you know, did 13 marathons, qualified for Boston 13 times. And I followed a very high carbohydrate diet. And so I think there definitely can be a very a disconnect there, you know, like you think, well, I'm doing this. So other people should do this. Um, and yeah, like you said, we're just not taught to think critically. And uh, the idea of CGMs really scare people. And I love that idea. I think every dietitian should wear one because I think you'd be shocked. Like, holy cow, like my blood sugar goes really high when I eat these things. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm all for it. So how did you make, like you're a long distance runner, you're metabolically healthy. How did you make this switch in your brain to say, okay, I'm going to do more low carb, you know, more carnivore type (laughs) diet. So in 2019, I was trying to qualify for the Olympic trials. So to run in the Olympic trials and the marathon, you have to run a 245 marathon for female under 245. So that's a six, 17 minute pace, mile pace for 26 miles. And I, I had run a 254. So I was training really hard. You know, I'm training super hard. I'm eating all these carbs. I was working at a hospital in Portland, Oregon. And I noticed in the summer, like I wasn't recovering well, like my body was hurting uh, disproportionately to what I had been used to. And, you know, you're like, oh, maybe I'm just stressed out. Maybe I need more water. But after about three or four weeks, things got worse. Like I noticed my anxiety was even worse. I noticed I was getting back spasms. I was having trouble sleeping. And so I reached out to two different sports dietitians and they both told me, you know what, you need to eat more carbohydrates. And I was like, are you sure? Cause I'm eating 350 grams a day. Yeah. Michelle, you need to eat 400. You need to eat, oh, you're eating six times a day. You need to eat eight times a day. Um, yeah. And so I did that. And as you can imagine, things went from bad to worse. I was going on, um, runs and I'm as a long distance runner. I mean, I could run up to 20 miles. And at that point I ran about a mile or a mile and a half and I was breaking out in cold sweats. Um, I was feeling nauseated and I kind of had my, like, I call it my come to Jesus moment. I had a rough day in the hospital, just, you know, difficult patient day. I came home early. I fell asleep at like five, you know, in the evening and I woke up at two in the morning and it just felt like my muscles were on fire. Like everything hurt. I'm walking around my living room. I, what do I do? How do I get this pain to stop? And so at two in the morning, I drove to 7-Eleven. I got 30 pounds of ice. I come home, I put it in the bathtub. It's like now like three in the morning, I'm sitting in ice 
crying and my wife comes in and is like, you know, maybe we should do something different. And I was like, yeah, I'm done. I'm never running again. Screw this. I'm too old. This isn't working. And that next day I was like, you know, maybe I should follow a lower carbohydrate diet. If I'm not going to run again. And at that point, my only goal said, Hey, you know what? Maybe if I drop the carbs and I have more protein, it'll help my muscles because my muscles just hurt. So yeah, that was my only thought. And that's, I was going to follow a ketogenic diet. And then I learned about that crazy guy, Sean Baker (laughs) and got kind of excited. Like, why don't we try this, you know, all meat animal based diet. Um, and I just decided I would follow that for 30 days. And for anyone who's listening, like my, my, my partner, my wife was like, no, this is eating disordered. I do not want you to do that. But I, I just had this intuition. I don't, I can't describe it, but I just decided, you know what, what I'm doing isn't working. What harm is there in trying this for 30 days? And, um, three weeks later, I, this is, this is probably one of the highlights of my journey in my life. Three weeks later, I remember I came home from work and my wife asked me to sit, you know, will you sit with me? I'm like, sure. And she said, I don't know if I like this low carb way of eating it, but this is the best your anxiety has been in the 11 years that I've known you three weeks. And that's when I became curious. I became kind of angry at the healthcare system. Um, my muscle pain disappeared. I, like I said, I, my anxiety was gone. Um, and that's when I just said, okay, I've got to learn everything. And just, I contacted anyone who would listen, you know, I reached out to Dr. Eric Westman and Chris Palmer and like, let's teach me, let me learn. And that's when I, I, I just was fascinated. And, um, yeah, that it, it was the, it was kind of the beginning of my low carb journey. Wow. That's, you know, that's remarkable. As a matter of fact, in, in the movie fat fiction, they interviewed five of my patients who had reversed diabetes and made lifestyle changes going low carb keto and stuff. But the, the intriguing thing is all five. And I think it was too controversial to talk about at the time, but all five of them said their anxiety, depression, sleep all got better and their quality of life got better. Regardless of the, the weight loss was secondary to them. They said yeah. the mental focus. And then what's impressed me. And we've talked a lot on the podcast is I've seen a lot of people go carnivore, uh, stick man bleeding out there, Brett Lloyd, great guy. And he's, uh, his whole, everything changed bipolar, yeah. everything got better. And I thought, Hmm, maybe there's must be something to this. And I don't know if it's addition or subtraction, whether it's you're avoiding bad stuff that is too stimulating to your brain or, or, or knocks down serotonin, or there's something in that that makes you do better. But it's very intriguing to me, this idea. And, and you're not the first I've heard say that I've heard so many people say once they went carnivore, their mental function, anxiety, depression got better. Yeah, I think it's, I would have to say it's definitely a combination because I think for so long, I, you know, one thing we don't teach in dietetics is bioavailability. Like, you know, we're, I had no idea bioavailability, meaning like, what can your body actually use and absorb? I think finally I was eating all this, you know, all this meat, I was eating beef and liver. I was finally getting, you know, not just the protein. Cause I think that's where people get confused. It's like, Oh, protein. Well, of course it's protein, but it's also B12, folate, B6, you know, carnitine, tarring, all these things that my body needed and my brain needed, and my brain needed saturated fat and following a very high carbohydrate diet, it was lower in fat. It was certainly very relatively lower in protein. And I, I was no longer eating tons of oatmeal and tons of wheat. You know, I, I suffered with anemia. I mean, I shared my book to the point of like, I fell asleep at work on my keyboard and I typed like a 12 page email of the letter S. <laughs> I woke up to like, oh my God. Um, I was, my ferritin was six, you know, I was so anemic. Uh, and I, I was, I eating meat? Yes. But I was also eating so much oats. Well, what do oats have? Phytic acid. What does phytic acid do? It binds to iron, it binds to calcium, you know? So when I, when I gave my body a break, when I removed all these carbohydrates and removed all this plant material, I truly believe my brain and my body finally were able to heal. And I'm not anti-carbohydrate. I definitely think it's situational. I'm at a point now um, where I've certainly added some plants back. But I think for many, many people where our bodies and our guts are so damaged, it certainly makes sense to, to, um, to see if that's a good step for you. Well, would it make sense for me to have this, this animal-based diet that's not going to have any um, anti-nutrients to see if that can actually help me heal? I think that's- the question that you guys like placed, is it adding or subtracting? And, you know, Michelle, you mentioned that it's both. Um, I think we have enough data to probably say it's both. There's been uh, studies on, you know, kind of sort of mental health outcomes of eating a real food diet that have shown improved uh, interventional trials that have shown improvements in 
uh, depression and anxiety, right? Uh, there's been trials, low carb. There's an amazing study that was a real food diet just came out. Uh, why am I blanking on her name? An awesome, awesome uh, dietitian from Australia, Rowena Field. Yes, Rowena Field, um, Kirion Rooney, who put out a trial where they literally looked at a real food diet, right? Versus uh, they had a real food run in and they randomized uh, patient groups into real food diet and real food ketogenic diet. Mm. And and it was a great study. Yeah, everybody improved, you know, with their with their chronic pain, right? But the low carb ketogenic diet seemed to improve more with some added uh, benefits and mental health outcomes like anxiety, depression. So I think uh, probably there is it. Liter- I think we have enough data now, Brian and Michelle, to say it is both. Yeah. It is eating real food, and it is the ketogenic diet that has a unique property. Um, yeah, I was really encouraged when I saw the study, the case study with Dr. Um, Sethi Shabani, I know, and others put out with three people that had a binge eating disorder. I presented this at the Low Carb USA, and they were put unfollowed, you know, on a, they were put on a ketogenic diet. Were you a part of that, Dr. Tro? I don't. Yeah, yeah. That's, yeah, uh, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so you know what I'm talking about. And one of the things that they, um, they, one of the outcomes was their mental health improved you know, and, and obviously they, these, all these people lost weight and they had reductions in their eating disorder, um, tendencies and cravings. But the fact that anybody who's listening to this, like, you know, like if, if you've struggled with anxiety or depression, like it, it's like being in chains. So having that improve, you know, and, and having an option out there, a nutritional option out there that could potentially help this improve, I think is huge. It's like one of my life goals to help get get that message out. I'm so encouraged that Dr. Chris Palmer is gonna be doing clinical trials with the ketogenic diet specifically in depression. But um, yeah, it almost sounds hokey. Like, oh, your your mental health improved that much in three weeks? Yeah, it did, it all, did. Yeah, of all this stuff Tro and I took, or probably me more so took heat when we came out and said, look, we're seeing this. We were seeing this before we had the day, but we're seeing it in our patients. We're like, they're not making it up. They're feeling better. Yeah. And their joints aren't hurting and their backs not hurting. And, and, you know, I think that's a big thing as we start getting into this science of calories in calories out, and we're all going to fight till we die on this thing. But the point is we had Dr. Speakman on, uh, you know, uh, the podcast and at least five of my patients were upset with me to a degree of saying, Hey, we're not mice living in a cage where you just give us a certain amount of food. I was doing great. And then my wife left me, I was doing great. And then this happened at work because we have to factor those things in doing locking someone up in a hospital is not life. That's not how it works. Unless you're locked up for the rest of your life, then that would be <laughs> something different. But yeah. most of us, we have these challenges. You say, okay, I understand the science and that's what I'm seeing more and more people get it and they know it's bad. But when everyone's sitting there eating pizza, you know, that there's peer pressure, there's social, there's so yeah. much involved. That's not just saying, okay, eat this many calories. Like, you know, but the thing is what the reason I got on this train over here is because um, a lot of people, when they're anxious, they eat more, they're stress yeah. eaters, right. Or they're anxious. They don't eat more. So, you know, but most, a lot of, most of my patients, when they get stressed out, they want to eat more. They just, their, their, their medicine is grabbing food. Right. Yeah. And for you back when you were doing the anorexia, you know, the, it's like your control was not in not eating, having control over that. So it's a, there's so much when, when I, I think right now people are feeling out of control in the world and yes. that's the one thing that they can control sometimes is yeah. what they eat or don't eat. We, we do a very poor job in society of teaching people emotional management skills. You know, I certainly know as a young person, um, if there was issues in my household, you know, my mom, I have a very good relationship now with both my parents, but I, my mom didn't say like, wow, I'm feeling stressed. I should journal and go for a walk. You know, like we don't teach that. And so that's, um, I always tell people, you know, I've had people ask me like, what's the number one thing you would recommend people do who want to change or who are maybe overweight or stressed out. And I say, you know, the first thing is before you even worry about food and nutrition is just like have some, what I call radical honesty, like get honest with yourself. This isn't the time to be like, Oh, I'm fat. Oh, I'm a loser. It's time to be like, you know what? I'm, I'm really not healthy and I'm stressed and I'm yelling at my kids and whatever, like just be really honest, like sit there, whatever you need to do. And then from there, you know, working with somebody, cause I often think that, um, you, I mean, you nailed it. Like I can give somebody a, a great meal plan. We can, we could even, cook you all the food, but that doesn't change the fact that we're living in a crazy stressful time during the pandemic. That doesn't change the fact that 
you know, people are losing jobs, losing loved ones, and you just have normal stress. Like we're not going to get rid of stress. Like we live in a stressful world. So, you know, that's another thing that I'm uh, learning how to cope with stress without food, whether that's, you know, learning how to like, like Tro and I were talking about for us, you know, exercise is a really powerful um, thing to do. I think that's great for everybody. And it certainly doesn't need to be like, like me, like lots of running, lots of miles. It can be so walking, you know, reading, get, get outside, get in the sun, breathing, connecting with people. Um, there's so many different ways like beyond food that can, that are going to improve your quality of life for sure. Can we, can we talk about this a little bit? Like how our society, you know, look at how society treats, uh, stress coping mechanisms, food. It's like, Oh, just have a little bit, just have some in moderation. Everybody deserves a donut, right? Alcohol, just have one drink, drink in moderation, have a drink, unwind stress, Sam Adams, get your COVID vaccine, get some free beer, right? You know, Krispy Kreme, get your COVID vaccine, get some free donuts, right? So the, the, the thing is our society and our societal pressure, the way we, you know, we actually condone using food and alcohol for stress relief, right? And to some extent, if you look at other stress relief mechanisms, meditation, that's considered new age and, you know, what doctor talks about meditation, right? Journaling, right? Like sitting down, writing out your thoughts, talking to somebody, like how many doctors are referring to counselors, right? What about prayer, right? Prayer, right? That's looked at as like, you know, oh, you know, that's like a passe way of handling stress. What about community? You know, get in, talk to people that are struggling the way you are, right? Like the, we do not, like nobody, I've never met somebody who said, oh, I was stressed out. You know, um, I, you know, meditated, I prayed, I went to, you know, I went to the gym and I exercised and I'm so, I regret what I did, doc. I really regret it, you know, but everybody says like, I was under stress. I ate this, I drank that, you know, I sat around and I watched Netflix and like, I just, you know, I regretted it. But our yeah. society, like, I don't know what it is. We just don't promote, like, hey, these things may are just short-term band-aids for your stress. And if you don't recognize the stress and do things that are in line with your health goals, right, you're not going to be happy. There's other ways to manage that stress. And I, I don't know. I, I feel like, like our society doesn't embrace that. Like, we're not, we're not like a society that says, like, great, go to temple, go to synagogue, go to church, right? We're not a society that says, go to your AA meeting, talk about your problems, share your vulnerabilities. Like, we're a shaming society that forces people to be, you know, closed off from the community. They hold in the things that they do wrong. And even our medical professionals, I've never met a doctor who said, you know, go, let's get you into a counselor right now. Let's get you, you know, go meditate, go journal, go, you know, like, hey, exercise is not about calories out. It's about mental health. Like, let's get your mind right. So I'm not a doctor Brian. anymore, Charo, man? <laughs> well, Brian, except for you. You know what, Brian? Oh, I'm going to say this more. except for Brian. But, you know, but, but yeah. Good. Yeah. Oh, no, sorry. I went on my, like, I went on my off on my, I, sorry, I do, I, I do I, rants. I, I, I do I, rants, I, Michelle. I'm sorry. I you know? a thousand percent. I couldn't agree more. And, you know, I think, unfortunately, um, you have a, you know, dietitians are supposed to be in the nutrition professionals. And so you have this group of supposed experts that says all things in moderation. So why wouldn't you have a donut or a cookie if you're stressed? You could have it in quote unquote moderation, right? So that's the really, really dangerous message. One, nobody knows what moderation is. Two, for many people, you know, having, like you said, that cookie, you're going to get that uh, blood sugar response, it's going to cause, you know, just physical problems. And then you're going to get like that dopamine hit, it, you know, can actually cause psychological problems. But that's not something we're taught. We're just taught as dietitians to tell people like, oh, it's fine in moderation, which is, you know, <clears throat> it, it comes from the top, it comes from you have these corporate sponsors of processed foods that are teaching the, you know, us, and then people like people are very addicted. We don't talk about this at all in, in, in dietetics and nutrition, but people are addicted to processed foods. So we have a culture that's not only addicted to this, we have our nutrition professionals telling them like, oh, sure, it's fine in moderation. And then you have people that it's a very easy coping skills, like change is hard, shifting your habits. It, it takes, um, you know, conscious thought, it takes time, it takes effort. And, you know, eating processed foods doesn't. 
Um, so often people will continue the cycle for a very long time. And I've even had people, it breaks my heart when I have people tell me like, oh yeah, my dietitian said it was fine if I had a few cookies or whatever. It's like, those are the people that should be like, hey, let's, like you said, let's do something else. Let's do something that might not potentially damage your brain and your body. Let's go for a walk. Let's call your friend. Let's sit outside in the sun. Let's pet your dog. You know, it doesn't have to be these ridiculous. Um, yeah. And the same thing, meditation is kind of looked at this like woo or prayer, but there's a reason that these, these things, I mean, we even have studies on this, that they can actually calm your brain, you know? So we, as a society, we, we have to do a better job of teaching people how to manage emotions appropriately and appropriately being without dangerous substances. And I would include processed foods and sugar as a dangerous substance. You know, we recognize as a society that using heroin to handle um, emotions is not good. Maybe using cocaine is not good. Certainly even using cigarettes and nicotine is not good. But, you know, if you using sugar is still considered like, oh, that's fine. We all do that. La, la, la. So I think as a society, we have to start kind of changing how we think about um, coping with stress for sure. And it's hard because the peer pressure of social, uh, of, you know, of people really is, if you're not drinking, I'm having a glass of wine. Like here, Michelle, have a glass of wine. Please have a glass. Cause I want you like, then it's okay for me to have it or please yeah. have dessert. I'm having dessert here. Just taste it. Have some, have, cause yeah. they feel guilty <laughs> that they're eating it and they want you to be part of it. It's almost like the addict who cleans themselves up and other people want them to use with them again, you know? And it's well, not I'm out of bad intention either. It's just that they, they want you to be part of it and they want you to enjoy what they're enjoying. Of course. And I, I truly believe, yeah, most people, it's not out of bad intention, but it's almost like I said on other podcasts, like you have to be okay being different. Like if you're like right now, we know that I, I believe it's 88% of our population is metabolically unhealthy. So if you want to be that 12% that's metabolically healthy, you have to be okay being a little weird. You have to be okay being like, you know what? I'm just going to have water or, Hey, you know what? I appreciate that you made that right now. I'm doing this thing, you know? And almost like I take, I take pride in that. Like, Hey, you know what? I'm for me, you know, I'm training for a long distance event. Um, it's really important for me that I do this. I'm really important for me that I don't eat these things. I'm happy to hang out with you. I'm happy to, (laughs) you know, but I'm just, I'm not going to be eating that, that sugary stuff. Um, and that's hard. I, I totally hear that's hard. I have people all the time, like, why can't you just do this? Especially as an athlete, you know, like, Oh, why don't you do this? Um, but I think over time, just like you were saying, Dr. Tro, um, I don't regret it. It helps build, it, it's built, it's built my self-esteem up. I, I like who I am. I like where I'm going. I like how I feel. And when you are constantly worried about what everyone else thinks and giving into this peer pressure, it doesn't, you don't like who you are and you don't like how you feel. Yeah. Can and I, it's what everyone I, else is doing, right? Do what works for you. Ultimately. Can I challenge you a little bit? Can I challenge you a little bit? So you are, I mean, look, you, the, the prevailing message right now is, uh, restrictive diets have no place in eating disorders, right? Mm. You're somebody who personally suffered from an eating disorder. So can you talk to me about, you know, and you're a dietitian, right? The most, you know, the most pervasive group of health professionals that kind of propagate that message. How do you reconcile this? How do you reconcile that? Right? So yeah, my whole presentation at Low Carb USA. Um, See, if you would have been there, Tro, you would know the answer. <laughs> I'll be in there in Boca. I'll be there in Boca. All right, man. So, so I'll be yeah, there. Yeah, no, absolutely. So, and I agree because here's the deal. They, the pervasive message, like you said, has been like, you cannot ask somebody with a dysfunctional relationship with food to restrict food because the, the thought behind that, and I, I believe it comes from a good place is if we, you know, you're already struggling with food, you're already struggling eating enough. So we, if we ask you to restrict carbohydrates or we ask you to restrict sugar, this is going to further exacerbate your dysfunction and gonna prevent you from being well. But what that doesn't take into account, and this is incredibly important, what effects do carbohydrates and sugar, and I would say more specifically those processed carbohydrates, have not only on your body, like the physiological, but also on your mental health. And what I have found is that many people that are struggling with like eating disorders, myself included, I suffered from extreme hypoglycemia. You know, I get high blood sugar, low blood sugar. I was constantly eating granola bars and cereal and all these carbohydrates. So I was constantly riding this blood sugar roller coaster. And then I was constantly having anxiety. You know, uh, we know now that when you have a lot of, and Georgia E talks about this, a lot of those processed carbohydrates are sugar. It can actually shift the neurotransmitters in your brain. 
you can actually have glutamate go very, very high, um, you know, which can actually prevent your brain from engaging in neuroplasticity. So as someone who's suffering with eating disorder, you know, neuroplasticity is, I, I love neuroplasticity, that concept that your brain can change and mold and you can heal. But if you're suppressing neuroplasticity, and there's obviously other ways to do it through trauma or whatever, but by eating a lot of those processed foods, if you can't, if your brain can't mold and change, how can you recover and have a meaningful life? So I think what the, the problem with that is, the problem with saying like, oh, restrictive diets or ketogenic diets are bad for eating disorders. You're not looking at what those quote unquote foods, and I, so I don't even consider like sugar and Pop-Tarts foods, but what those can potentially do to your body and your brain. So when we take those out and we feed somebody potentially with an eating disorder, you know, those high fat foods, those meats, those saturated fats, um, and you're, you know, you're getting all those nutrition. What we see is we stabilize blood sugar, we stabilize weight and the brain finally functions correctly. So we start to see a diminishing, uh, diminishment in depression and anxiety. I will caveat. And I've had people ask me if somebody is severely underweight, like dangerously underweight, um, I think there is a time and a place potentially for a very high carbohydrate approach. Uh, I would compare it to if somebody comes into the ICU and their blood sugar is 600, I'm not putting them on a high carbohydrate diet. I'm giving them insulin stat to get that down, you know, or I'm sorry, a low carbohydrate diet. I'm giving them insulin to get that down. Sometimes you're how, what you do acute is different than what you're going to do long-term. If that makes sense. Right. Absolutely. So, yeah. Yeah. What do you, you know, here's another thought. And we had Agnes Satan, uh, Dr. Agnes Satan on a while back, and she has a great uh, paper out on kind of the Western diet. And um, I, and uh, she puts this theory out and I, I actually kind of agree with it and, and uh, have had similar thoughts that the people with anorexia, the people who are really restricting, you know, centrally restricting what they eat, um, they actually enjoy ketosis. And when they, and I mean, right, if your pain's getting reduced, your anxiety is getting reduced, right, with ketosis, why would you want to stop that, right? So look at it from the kind of the victim's perspective, like the person with the disease, right? They may not be conscious in understanding that they, they may be enjoying that state, right? So they're not eating, puts them in ketosis. They, the lack of nutrients gets so severe, stress hormones go up and kind of the body deteriorates, right? That's the cycle. We have to try to break. I wonder, I wonder if, you know, we can come up with a compassionate uh, way if we're relegating to somebody to tube feedings, which I, I don't think is done anymore, that if at the least, you know, we could do a uh, study that compared nutritional approaches in that moment, you know, um, yeah. and which one would do better. I, I wonder if that's, you know, ethical, if it should be considered, um, you know, I wanted to get your thoughts on that. I know this, I, they don't do tube feeding anymore, right? I, I just the most severe cases, I think. You're right. It has to be a very, very severe case of anorexia to do tube feeding. So do you think that it's ethical to do like a, you know, a, you know, a low carb versus standard approach, you know, a uh, nutritional approach in a moment like that. I just wanted to hear your thoughts about that. Um, yeah. I mean, well, the thing about a low carbohydrate diet, we know it's safe, sustainable, and complete. And, you know, the statistics for anorexia are staggering, right? Like anorexia has the, the highest mortality, meaning more people die of anorexia than any other psychiatric disorder, more than schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, major depression. I actually... In my book, I cited a paper that um, the people with anorexia, they did a meta-analysis and of the people who died that they followed of a seven-year period, 20% of people with anorexia actually took their own life. Like that is how low it was. It wasn't even the medical complications. They committed suicide. And in my experience, working with many people with eating disorders and obviously having an eating disorder myself, you desperately want to get better. Like you truly do, but it's like, you're just in this... I can't even describe it other than, and you, you experience this, is this, this like cage, this like mental block. So I remember thinking like, if there was anything I could have done, like if you came to me as a 12 year old and said, this is what we're going to do. It's going to help your mind. It's going to help your mind not want to be sick. 
it's going to help your mind be clear because since I've adopted a low carbohydrate diet, my racing anxiety that I've had for, you know, 25 years is gone. So not only does that ethical in my view, that's necessary. You know, I don't see why we, we can't do that. You know, and my only imagine, imagine going to an RRB and saying, you know, let me do a study with anorexia patients on tube feeding to, you know, with a, a low carb tube feeding versus, and we don't, I don't, there is no low carb tube feeding, by the way, no, hopefully, not. hopefully keto kind, you know, our friends over at keto kind at some point will be able to come up with something like that. I know yeah, that I think they're, that's they're working on that. Um, but what, what there, that you couldn't, do you think an IRB would approve that? Uh, yeah, right. You're looking at, right. Imagine going back to the dietetic school people that trained you and saying, Hey, you know, uh, you know, there's, you know, this is what I propose. What do you think they'd say? Uh, I think they would say, go kick rocks. Like, I, I mean, they'd probably yeah. say other than that, but I don't think they would approve it. I mean, I think it's, it's still, it's still very, um, yeah. I mean, I don't have to tell you guys, low carb is still considered, um, dangerous in many areas, you know, and I think specifically with a population that's very low weight or underweight, um, I think they would really struggle. I think they would think it was an ethical issue problem. Um, I, but you what know what, if you match for calories, you know, uh, you're, you're I mean, giving them two feet anyway, right? Maybe, I mean, I, maybe I'm skeptical just because, uh, I've, I've had, um, you know, I just recently tried to get my book approved for continue education and I was denied. <laughs> so but I don't know. Um, you know, if you, perhaps if you presented it, like, you know, we're going to present, this is what we're going to do. We're going to match for calories. And you presented all the data on the anti-inflammatory effects, the, the potential of, um, reduced anxiety, the, you know, the, like you said, the potential, it, this is going to ha- help with weight gain. I, perhaps it's possible. I mean, if, if you want to start that study, I'll, <laughs> I'll jump on and help. But Do you hear that, Brian? So yeah, maybe one day, but you know, that's such yeah. a vulnerable population, you know, it's, it needs careful care and consideration. Yeah. And I think I'd, I'd like to change gears for a second here is that I'd like to hear your, your take, Michelle, like back then when you were 57 pounds, when you were looking in the mirror, were you seeing someone overweight and you were trying to get your weight down still and you were never satisfied? Because the reason I asked the question is right now with with social media, when someone puts a picture of themselves and all these people say, oh, you're disgusting, look at you. And I, and the mental effect that has on young, impressionable men and women, um, it, it's devastating. Or we even see with people who've lost 150 pounds where people go, look disgusting, look at all that loose skin. Instead of saying, oh my gosh, you lost 150 pounds in this negative, you know, bringing people down um, idea. And I'm, I'm wondering what your take is on that contributing to the eating disorders and all these kind of things that we're seeing. Yeah. I mean, when you are struggling with an eating disorder, you are incredibly fragile, you know, anything anybody said to me, um, I took as fact, I mean, I was very young, my brain was developing and I, I was, you know, being bullied at school. I was being called all kinds of names. And this of course was before we had social media and our cameras had phones and, Um, but I see this a lot, you know, as someone who's very active in social media, I see people saying mean things and bullying people. And, and yes, to answer your question, when I looked in the mirror, you know, I had severe body dysmorphia. I was, you know, literally (laughs) because I could tangibly feel my ribs, but I couldn't, uh, that's not what I saw in the mirror. And so one of my biggest things, um, one of my life goals and missions is to always default to compassion. You know, I don't, I'm never going to comment something negative on, um, some, like if somebody directly says something that's wrong or not fact, I may say like, Hey, you know, whatever, but social media can be downright mean. And I think for our young people who are, um, you know, trying to figure out life and often people just put the highlight reels on social media, right? You can have a crazy, terrible week and you post the one like, look at me picture. (laughs) So yeah, I do. I'm sure that's contributing to some of these issues that we see, you know, we, we kind of have the perfect storm. Like if I was going to tell you, like, how can I de- create depressed, anxious, sick humans? You know, what would you say? You'd say like, okay, let's have all this societal pressure to look great. Let's, you know, have all this food that's going to make you anxious to make you not look great. And, <laughs> you know, and all these pressures, like we, we don't have an environment where we feed people real food. I mean, that's another topic. Like I've, I've said before, I, I went to the grocery store last week people aren't putting food in their cart. 
like the person in front of me had a box of pizza, pop tarts, granola bars, popcorn, and a hot chocolate. Like, where's the food? What are you, you know, uh, it's, it's challenging and it's disheartening, but it's also like, I guess the, 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 hap, the, the positive message is you can heal. The body has a tremendous capacity to heal. Our minds have a tremendous capacity to heal. When we start feeding it, how humans were supposed to be fed. And when we start feeding it, you know, meat and fat, and we start, you know, getting all those um, vitamins and minerals. When we, st- when we stop having sugars, you know, um, that day I decided to stop running forever. I, I had no idea that my body would heal to a point, you know, where I could not only start running again, but start competing again. Like, you know, if you're listening to this and you're, and you're struggling, you know, somebody who just feels completely defeated, like don't give up. Like you, it's amazing how quickly you can heal when you change how you eat. I agree so much. Brian, you're muted. I agree so much. Gosh, darn it. I am. I agree too. I've, I forgot to unmute Tro. I got so excited, <laughs> but yeah, no, it's so important because I think, gosh, darn it guys, we can't just tear people down. And, 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 you know, as a society, I, I see that more and more. And that's why I started my other podcast, Life's Best Medicine to talk about these things. Like, how do we support each other? How do we, you know, I'm seeing that, like what Tro and I are doing with our communities and seeing, going for a walk and seeing two people connect and they talk and they say, Oh my gosh, you're into this too. So am I. Oh, great. Let's, let's, let's go for walks every Wednesday. And so they have someone to, to, to go through the journey with. And Michelle, what you said is so like, we just had a zoom meeting and so many people said, I feel like the loser because everyone else has a perfect life except me and everyone's doing perfect except me. And then everyone says me too, me too, me too, me too, <laughs> because everyone has struggles. It's not like you just get, you know, you start this thing and it's easy, but having people like, support each other. And, you know, one of my ladies just said, I suck this week. My, I've, I've had a horrible week and here's why. And it was great. Cause everyone goes, Oh my gosh, me too. Guess what? And it was so nice to say, Hey, it's okay. Like I have those tendencies too. It's okay. And then just to be, just to have someone else who thinks like you do, or is going through the same thing as you are. It's so, so healing. Truly. And like, you know, unfortunately I, we've, I think on social media, we've put out this presence that life is mostly easy and fun and happy. And the truth is life is really hard. Like it doesn't matter who you are, what you're doing. It doesn't matter if you're, you know, Jeff Bezos or you're a homeless person, like life is hard. You know, nobody's escaped. Nobody escapes difficulties with, you know, relationships and family and stress and struggles and whatever. And so that is one thing that we need each other. We need community. We need to be able to reach out and say, I'm struggling. I'm hurting. I'm tired. I'm angry, you know, and the more we can, do that. And the more we have, you know, people in our lives that we can, we can trust, we can, you know, um, just spend time with and talk, you know, how, how I'm sure most people listening, like, it's, you know, you're, you're feeling anxious, you're feeling upset. And then you, you know, you talk to a friend or you talk to your partner and you're just like, Oh, wow, I feel better. Like as humans, we're meant to connect. And unfortunately, you know, that's probably one of the, the worst things about social media is you'll put something out there and people will say mean stuff. So, uh, you know, I try definitely not to ever be a part of that and to discourage that. But um, yeah, I hope we can just continue to foster like positivity, community. Um, and that's that's kind of my goal is like if ever, you know, someone's negative, I'm just kind of like, I got to keep moving on. Life is so tough. I, I can't I can't even entertain negativity, you know. Yeah, the block button is getting easier for me now. I don't do it very often. It's very rare, but someone has to be very disrespectful and, you know, nasty. I try to just like, you know, just, I don't even look back most of the time, I, you know, because it's just so, you know, there's all, you know, there's going to be a negative, no matter how positive something is. You say, hey, it's beautiful, sunny day today. And so, no, it's not. It's going to be rain tomorrow. You look at you. <laughs> so it's just hard. Like, it's just like, I can't deal with this. So sorry. I hope you get a little better life or something, you know, like I like the Ben Bigmans of the world. That's who I, I gravitate to these kind of people who just say, look, you know, be a kind, decent person. And, and that's going to help us in our journey, no matter what we're doing. But I still understand you and Zach better running like crazy people for all those <laughs> miles. Just it's never clicked into my brain. I can't figure it out. Yeah. I tried and I pulled my hamstring. I tried to match his at a, at a, for a hundred yards, his hundred miles, but I'm not <laughs> built for that. Yeah. You know, it's funny. I, when I decided I was never going to run again, I, I was hope more, like I didn't run for a whole month and my wife who, you know, she likes to read, she likes her solitude. She just casually kind of said like, you know, you should go for a run. Like you're bothering me. <laughs> you're around too much. And I was kind of scared because I was, I was very low carb and I was like, wow, gosh, I don't know if I can really run low carb, but it was, you know, I was like, okay, Michelle, come on, drop the ego. Let's, I was like, I'm just going to go jog. And I went and jogged and I was gone for like an hour. And I felt great. 
And so my wife is really excited. She's like, oh, this is so great. You can be like a recreational runner. You'll like run on the weekends, whatever. And I was like, what if I run an ultra marathon? Like, I just got this crazy idea. Like, forget this 26.2 mile nonsense. Let me go run longer than that. And um, yeah, she wasn't super excited about that initially. But yeah, I reached out to Zach. Zach's actually my coach. Um, and it was like, all right, why don't I, why don't I get into a little bit of a training routine? And if things go well, give it like eight weeks that I'll register for a race. And I was just amazed. My recovery with the low carb diet was phenomenal. Like my body didn't hurt. I was happy. Like, you know, when you're in pain and you're running, it's not fun. And so, but the, this was, you know, February, 2020, I decided like, all right, I'm going to register for a race. And then the world changed. Um, I was signed wow. up for a 50 mile race in May and that got canceled. And, you know, at this point I lost all my dietetic hours and I'm angry at the world because I'm so, you know, I'm, <laughs> I'm getting my health back, but the health profession is, is not great. So that's when I started writing my book. Um, but yeah, so I registered for a race in October and that got canceled. And finally I registered for a race. It was a six hour run. It was right outside of Las Vegas, Nevada. And I was like, well, if anyone's going to race, <laughs> probably the, you know, it's probably going to happen in Las Vegas. And it actually, it happened. So in November 7th, 2020 was my first ultra marathon and I ran 44.63 miles in six hours. So that's an 804 minute pace. I won the race. I cried like a baby afterwards. It was just, it was, it was this moment of going from my health is gone. I'm not going to be able to run. I'm an anxious mess to holy moly. I just ran you know, for six hours and it just felt, it kind of felt like everything came full circle and I can't even describe, and I'm sure both you guys can relate just the gratitude I had, um, the joy that I felt and just the passion. Like I was like, I'm on a good path. I know this is, if I can do this, if I can overcome everything I've overcome to this point, like, I hope I can help people do the same, you know? So it, yeah. And I've just been <laughs> kind of continuing awesome. to run like a crazy person ever since my next race is in November. So I'm excited about that. That's awesome. That's like, you know, you just bring that spirit, that positive vibe, that spirit to people. And yeah, I'm so happy for your patience. You go, okay, we got this. I'm in your corner. Let's do this thing. Right. And so, so it's really important. So for these people, if they want to track you down, how do they track you down? How do people get in touch with you and, and get your services? Yeah, absolutely. So um, you can find me at my website, the dietitians Um, I'm active on Instagram at run, eat, meet, repeat, all one word. And then on Twitter at Michelle Hearn RD. I'm actually going to be starting coaching services uh, middle of October. So I'm really excited. I'm going to be working with a group. So stay tuned for that. I'll have that on my website and all my social media as soon as that happens. Wow, that's awesome. That's exciting stuff. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah, that's really cool. Yeah, <laughs> tell, you, yeah, tell you people know, where to find it. And it's oh, on yeah. Audible now. It's on Audible, guys. Yeah, it's on Audible. So, you know, if you if you have access to Audible, please, that helps me out. Download it, check it out. Um, if you want to get the paperback or the ebook, that is, um, everything's available on Amazon. So just Amazon.com, The Dietitian's Dilemma. And, and that's awesome. I, I, I had the pleasure of talking to Michelle a little bit at Low Carb USA, and she was telling me how hard it is to do Audible. Like, it's crazy. Could you imagine her trying to read and making it sound natural? Like, I can't, I just can't do it. Makes me crazy. I can't do a teleprompter. Forget it, man. I'll never be president. One day, <laughs> one, day one day, maybe, Brian. <laughs> Brian Lentz gets the president. You if know I what? Can't you, read. Should, you should go, uh, did, they, did they finish the recall? And, you know, you should consider that in California. Nope. Michelle, Michelle Hearn, this was no, awesome. I'll run six Thank hours you. straight first. <laughs> Thank you so much for everything you're doing, your book, uh, your lectures, your mission. Um, thank you for what you're doing. It's not easy to do what you did. And somebody who has been through it on both ends, I think, um, when you come out and kind of in support of this approach, I think it carries more weight. So I appreciate that. And I know as, as a dietitian, you're probably have taken considerable heat and probably more heat. So thank you for what you do. Yeah. Ah, thank you guys so much for having me on. This was awesome. I think just taking a stand and doing what's right. And you, and you say, look, it's not going to be popular, but it's working and my patients are getting better. What do you do? I think we're in the, that that's where we're at in medicine right now, you know, not rocking the boat. And so it, it's hard. It's, it, it is definitely a hard 
path for, you know, doctors are having a huge suicide rate right now too. And, you know, it's hard when they can't help people. You go in like you did, I'm going to be a dietitian. I'm going to save the world. And you're like, it's not helping people. Then what? Then you have to change tact. And that's what a good person does. And that's what a, a professional does. So yeah, thank you so much. And, and uh, just for your positive, everything you're doing. So do we have any questions? Are we allowed to do like a question? No, or two? We're, I, good. I don't see we're good. Let's thank, All right. let's thank our, uh, uh, you know, Patreon, Patreon people, supporters. thank you for thank you for coming. Thanks for for sticking with us and supporting us. You know, it's uh, it's a huge it. deal because Tro yeah, and I would we, be we, broke because we're yeah, like we don't take sponsors because we want to have great people on and know that they're just great people. All right, guys, listen. Thank you so much, Brian. It's a pleasure, Michelle. It's been a pleasure. Same. Thank you so much.